Well, hallelujah. I'm here and you're here, so that means we can get started, can't we? I did not bring my camera, so we can't put it on line while we're while I'm doing it, but it'll be it's being recorded. We're going to be in chapter five of Leviticus. Uh, when we as we go through Leviticus, there's some things said in Leviticus that are a challenge to many of the things people think are all right today. And uh, my big answer to that is this right here. Uh, just because we're not under the law, the law cannot bring righteousness in our life. We're not under the law. Doesn't mean that we should decide we can go ahead and do whatever we want. You know, uh, you get somebody saved, and what's the Bible say about grace? It teaches us to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. In this present age. He said it back then, but same thing today in this present age. And so uh, it isn't like, uh, uh, you know, uh, we've read over the scriptures many times when it says that that, that covenant is, is obsolete, that covenant is fading away, the glory of that went away compared to the glory of the new covenant, and all those verses that talk about that we're not under the law. And even, even, uh, even Paul said that no man is justified by the law as evident because the judge... The just are by faith. We, we're saved by faith. And uh, But even with that, I'm amazed today. I had this conversation with Debbie the other day. I said, well, we have Christians everywhere that think it's all right to have, have uh, sex before marriage and, and get drunk and act like the rest of the world. If the Spirit of God, and you don't know how many times I've gotten in trouble for saying this, but if the Spirit of God truly lives in you, then you're going to desire in your spirit man to live right. And your flesh may be wanting to do something else, but, but the, the, the spirit should overcome the flesh, not the flesh overcome the spirit. So we need to be living for God, amen? So that's why when some people say, I don't even understand, Pastor, why you'd ever care about Leviticus. I care about this Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Oh, along those lines, I want to tell you, I was talking to... You know, Mike Heiser, Mike and Pat Heiser, I'm so glad they spoke Sunday morning, and, and uh, they're getting ready to go back to Kenya, and, uh, huh, he took off today, and I was talking to him, and I said, you know, I'm having a struggle with something, Mike, he said, what is that? I said, I've studied Revelation in and out, and I can teach it, so I taught from the aspect that God wanted me to teach on, and that was, where are we in the timeline and I said, then I thought I'd go back and teach on tribulation and, and on the tribulation and what happens to the time until the time that we return with Christ. And then, and, and I said, I haven't had peace with doing it. So I might have to do it in a blog or something. And he goes, he said, I know that you respect this teacher, Bob Yandian. He's on the board of Andrew Womack, and uh, he was the head of Grace Church for his, his uh, great, great teacher of the word, Bob Yandian. I have great respect for him. And I said, what, so what did he say? He said the Lord told him not to spend time talking about things that have nothing to do with the born-again believer. I said, why did he say that? He said, because he was getting ready to teach on tribulation. And the Lord told him, they can read about tribulation. Truth about it is they didn't even know where they are with God. And I said, well, that kind of gives me a little bit more peace about not preaching on tribulation. I can talk about the bowls and the trumpets and I can talk about what the angels are going to But let me ask you this. What will that change in anybody here since we're not going to be here when that happens? It won't change a thing in our life. So that which God spoke to me about preaching things that we can apply to our life to live on this, in this day and age till we're raptured out of here, I feel more comfortable with it now than I ever have. We need to know how to live life today, don't we? And then one of these days, uh, we'll be raptured out of here. Now, I heard... And uh, uh, I don't know for certain, but they said, somebody told me that Carol Statham is going to be raptured first. Then the rest of us will follow. I don't know what that means, but anyway. No, I'm just messing with you. <laughs> You're afraid to hide. Uh, we'll, so we'll start in chapter 5 of Leviticus. And we're going to talk about the trespass offering. Specific acts of sin committed in ignorance. Non-specific acts of sin committed in ignorance. Now, the re when I start on this, I want to remind you of this. 
that you and I do not commit acts of sin in ignorance in the new covenant. And boy, have I had arguments with pastors about that. Well, somebody could be doing something wrong. Listen, to him that knoweth to do right and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Um, as a new covenant believer, it isn't that we don't sin, but it is that we have already had our sins taken care of. They're already covered. Now, how do we know that? One of this great scripture, I need to get in this, but one of these great scriptures I love, people say, you, you, think that's, you really think that's a great scripture? It's one of the greatest scriptures. You know what it's great scriptures? You know what it said? It said, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. And then he goes on and he says, uh, shall I sin more that grace may abound? God forbid. So somebody said, how's that a grace? Well, think about what it says. Think about what it's saying. Where sin abounds, grace even more so abounds. Shall I sin more that grace may abound? Now, let me tell you what, let me go ahead and interpret that in today's vernacular. When I sin more, there's more grace for every sin I commit. That's actually what it's saying. Shall I sin more that grace may abound? He says, God forbid. Why? Because the truth is also that. Somebody told me one time, said, uh, is it really possible for people to abuse grace? Uh, is it possible? Have you looked around? Have you seen how people are living? People that are saved by the grace of God are living like the same as the world. And they don't have an excuse because the most natural thing for a, a believer to do is to live for God. Did you know that? The, the Holy Spirit living on the inside is constantly moving me on to holiness. He's called the Holy Spirit. Not the sinful spirit. Not the mediocre spirit. Not, hey, I can do whatever I think I want to do, spirit. But the Holy Spirit who's constantly exerting uh, uh, influence on me in my soulless realm, my mind, will, and emotions. To do what? To live for God. So when I hear people believe, tell me, well, I don't, it doesn't bother me to sin. I just tell them, then you didn't get saved. I mean, we need to be bold about that. If you can uh, uh, commit acts of sin, well, everybody commits acts of sin, but, but if you can do that and you have no conscience about it, it's because God isn't living on you. Amen? The word trespass here has very much the same meaning in the, in, in the King James translation as it does in the present day user. We all understand a no trespassing sign, don't we? It says don't come in here. It means we're not to invade the rights of others. Liberty is a word which is misused and abused today. When I grew up, listen, does it bother you when I just talk before I get into Scripture and stuff? When I grew up, did you know we had a saying, and I don't know who first said it, but it had to be somebody famous. We wouldn't have repeated it so many times. But I remember they used to say, your rights end where others begin. And I always loved that. So we live in a day and age where we say, hey, I'm free to do whatever I want. No, you're not. Who is free to do whatever I want? If you were free to do whatever you want, we'd have no laws, and laws wouldn't even apply to you, would they? We're not free to do whatever we want. And our laws that have today were, were basically established by the law of Moses. Why do we know that it's wrong to kill? Well, we knew that before the law was established. Why? I want you to think about this. Long before God put his word on stone, wrote them on stone for Moses, they were already in people's hearts. They knew they weren't supposed to do that thing. A man that killed somebody knew he'd done something wrong. In, when Adam and Eve sinned against God in the garden, they hid themselves. Why? There was no law given, so how did they know? God wrote it on the inside of people. So when he wrote it on the command, on the stone, thou, we were without excuse. Without excuse. That's the reason it says in Romans 3, uh, 19, I think it is, that uh, 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 
that the law was given to those under the law. Why? That every mouth might be stopped and the whole world might become guilty before God. That was the purpose of the law. So when we get into these things, uh, even though some of these things you might go, well, wait a second. Uh, we don't live by this today. No, we're not made righteous by this today. But some of these principles here are still applicable. Amen? Uh, a lot of people go around parading, burning things, destroying things, and talking about liberty. You don't have liberty to go and destroy somebody else's property. That's not your liberty. Amen? I'm just trying to bring this down to the vernacular we understand after the things that have happened the last few years. If you have a fight for freedom and somebody's coming to, uh, and you have a revolution that you're fighting into to, for this nation, that's one thing. Uh, but, it, but if you're trying to find freedom by destroying other people's uh, uh, property, did you know you have, you've lost that fight already? We don't have, you don't get to, to exert your, your power over somebody else and call that a fight for freedom. Withholding, let me give you an example. A trespass is the invasion of the rights of either God or man. That's the reason we're talking about the sin of trespass. For example, withholding tithes from God was counted a trespass in Israel. Now, do I believe in the tithe? Yes. Somebody said, you believe in the tithe because you want to be able to support the church. No, I believe in the tithe because it's biblical. Uh, somebody told me one time, well, we're not under the law anymore. Well, let me ask you, now that we're under the law, is it okay to lie and steal and everything else? Well, no. So what you want to do is pick and choose the things you want to obey. Our trespasses arise, you know where they come out of? They come out of a sin nature. And, uh, and the devil works on that sin nature all the time. My old man that answers to God died on the cross with my Lord and Savior. But I've been living in this body. I prayed for a gal to be healed. I don't know how she's doing, but I prayed for her to be healed of smoking. Is she doing good? And, uh, and I told her, did you know that I can uh, lay hands on you now and absolutely take away your addiction to nicotine? Because I've done it with every other addiction. I guarantee you I can do that. The power of God will take away your addiction to nicotine. What I cannot do is change your mind. So I remember when I quit smoking cigarettes so many years ago and... Uh, and, uh, man, I didn't have that strong yearning to do it, but you know what I did have? I'd eat a meal, and I'd say, oh, I need to smoke a cigarette. Why? That was the habit. I had to change my mind about that part. I was no longer addicted to nicotine, but I'd always done that. I'd eat a meal, smoke a cigarette. Why? You follow? Pie should follow a meal, not a cigarette. But it was just habit, so you can't do that. But we have... When you've acted a certain way for many years, that's the reason discipleship is so important is because uh, a, a baby in Christ is not going to act mature because they're babes in Christ. So they start learning as God, in, in, as they learn and get discipled and as God in, uh, uh, puts an influence on the soulish realm to change all that. But they don't change overnight, do they? That's why we call them a babe in Christ. What do you give babes? Milk. You don't throw a steak out in front of a baby on the floor, do you? Well, I've known some kids that probably eat it, but anyway. Uh, God makes it very clear that he cannot and will not accept the works of unsaved men to accomplish your salvation. So that's the reason we have so much said about sin and trespass and all this stuff. Because an unbeliever's righteousness is his filthy rags. Remember that. He doesn't save by works of righteousness. So when you, when you have somebody say, man, uh, even at a funeral, boy, he was always a good guy. He did this, he did that. That's not enough to make it to heaven. And a lot of believers think that unbelievers are just bad people. I've never said that. They're unsaved people. There are unsaved people out there that actually act better than some Christians do. But it's not our actions that get us. So all of this that God is laying the foundation for is by the time he gets us through Leviticus, it ought to shake a guy to the core and say, then really nothing we do is very good. Yes, that's true. That's the whole idea. 
They had to make offering for everything. Because the carnal mind, it says in Romans 8, 7, because the carnal mind is at enmity against God, it's not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Romans 8, 7. Then sat, I'll, I'll, I'll get into the scripture right after this. I promise I will, but I want to say. Then they said unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that you believe on him whom he hath sent. So he cuts them right off at the knee and said, You want to know what, a, what doing the work of God is? Jesus said, Believe in me. I'm the one that was sent. Okay, Leviticus 5.1. If a soul sin and hear the voice of swearing and is, a, and is a witness, whether he hath seen or known of it, if he do not utter it, then he shall bear his iniquity. Uh, so if a soul sin and hear the voice of swearing could be better translated, if a person sin in this respect, that he hears the voice uh, uh, of adjuration, in other words, to do the hearing of an oath and being a witness. If a witness has seen or knows something, but he withholds the truth. But people don't understand. Withholding the truth when the truth should be spoken is a pretty bad thing. Uh, if, a, uh, if somebody does something and, uh, and you know about it, it isn't good enough not just to speak about it. If you're asked, you need to tell. You know, when we were kids, do you remember how w we'd call somebody that told something bad? A tattletale. Don't be a tattletale. Well, if somebody in authority asked me, well, did so-and-so do this? If I knew it, I'd say, yeah. Right? Come on, guys. How deep is our relationship with God? Let me give you another thing. If they came up to Jesus and said, Jesus, did so-and-so do this? You know what Jesus would have said? Well, yeah. He didn't even deal with that problem. He always admitted that problem. He said with the, the woman that was caught in adultery, what did he say? He didn't say, no, she didn't do it. I know she didn't do it. What did he say? Let he who is without sin cast the first stone. Amen? We need some honesty in the body of Christ. I'm telling you. Uh, what, look what it says in James. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good, I think I quoted it just a while ago, didn't I? And doeth it not to him, it is sin. Solomon prayed to God concerning the very issue of not telling the truth when a witness ought to tell the truth. If any man trespass against his neighbor and an oath be laid upon him to cause him to swear and the oath come before thine altar in the house, then, then hear thou in heaven and do and judge thy servants condemning the wicked to bring his way upon his head and justifying the righteous to give him according to his righteousness. Uh, and, you know... Let's say the town gossip is crossing the square of the town. And she sees the president of a bank crossing the street. His secretary is leaving the bank to go to lunch, and a car hits her, and she's crossing the street. The bank president rushes over and picks her up in his arms and takes her to the doctor's office. The gossip runs to the telephone to call the wife of the bank president. Did you know, Madge, I saw your husband with another woman in his arms? Now, although that fact, it wasn't the whole truth, was it? Uh, many years ago, I, I picked up a lady that went to the church. It just came a drenching rain, and she was walking down Hudson. I pulled over, rolled down the window of the pickup, and said, Hey, uh, you, you all right? She goes, I'm just going to the store. I, my husband's supposed to pick me up there. And I said, I'll run you up to the store. I ran her up to the store. The next day, people in Buckner were saying, I saw the pastor with another woman in his truck. Well, they didn't have the whole story, did they? They didn't understand about it. Uh, over in the book of Proverbs, we find a list of things which God hates. And in that list of seven, we find a lying tongue. People that bear false witness. People that stir up trouble. In Matthew 26, 63 and 64, and the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us whether it be the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said. Nevertheless, I say unto you, 
Hereafter shall you see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Did he, de did he deny? No. He expounded upon that truth. In Leviticus 5.2, Or if a soul touch any unclean thing, whether it be a carcass of an unclean beast or a carcass of an unclean cattle or the car a carcass of an unclean creeping thing, if it be hidden from him, he also shall be unclean and guilty. Now, this is the law concerning uncleanness. A man might become polluted by contact with a dead animal without being aware of it. Uh, you know, we can't be out in the world without becoming unclean by seeing things and hearing things and, and dwelling on things that are not good. Even, even letting things through our eye ge gate and ear gate that are unclean. We ought not do that. Uh, I know that... Uh, I know I'm washed in the blood of Christ. I know that nothing I do will ever affect my salvation. But did you know the things I do and hear can affect my witness here on earth? And, 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 and uh, not my place with God, but perhaps my fellowship with God if I start listening to, to things on this earth and I quit communing with God. How many times have we seen that happen? Or if he touched the uncleanness of a man, whatsoever uncleanness it be, that man shall be defiled with it and it will be hid from him when he knoweth of it, then he shall be guilty. It's the same th case as the unclean animal. God makes a distinction between a man and a beast. The penalty for this is more severe than for touching the beast. Or if a soul swear, cons uh, pronouncing with his lips to do evil or to do good, whatsoever it be that man shall pronounce with an oath, and it, it be hid from him when he knoweth it, then he shall be guilty in one of these. Careless speech what he's dealing with now. Sometimes we promise to do something and we don't do it. I'd rather not promise it if I'm not going to do it. If I promise to be a man of God and a man of integrity, then I'm going to be a man of God and I'm going to be a man of integrity. When you have done everything you possibly can to submit to the Holy Spirit and allow him to lead you, you will still make mistakes in this world. But own up to it. Amen? Own up to it. I know this is a silly example, but I, I remember when I, the first time I stole something, I was a little bit of bitty kid, and my dad and I walked into a little convenience store in Enid, Oklahoma, and I came out and he saw me unwrapping a Jolly Rancher candy. He knew I hadn't bought that. Did you steal that candy? It was right there. I said, did you steal that candy? And I was old enough to know. Yeah, yes, Daddy. He made me go in there, apologize to the doorkeeper, I mean to the storekeeper, pay for that little bit of candy. Then he took it from me and threw it away. He said, you can't live a life like that. Now, my dad was not a good person. He had certain things that he had to make a stand on, and I'm glad he taught me not to steal. You know what I'm saying? You ever have kids and they'll, they, you know he did something or she did something, then you ask them about it and say, uh-uh, uh-uh. Get them to tell the truth. They need to start telling the truth right early on in life. Amen? Simon Peter, he boldly declared that he'd not deny Christ but would die defending him. He didn't do a good job of that, did he? And he died, denied him over and over again. I, horrible thing. I don't blame Peter from going from that situation and going back to fishing. He probably thought, well, I'm no good at this. <laughs> I'll go back to what I know, fishing. But I love the fact that then Jesus did what? Restored him to his ministry? Yeah. Became a mighty man of God afterward. And it shall be when he shall be guilty in one of these things that he shall confess that he has sinned in that thing. That, that, that's 5-5. Five, five. Listen. If you've been guilty of one of these things, that, confess it. You know, you shouldn't have to get in a court wrong, room to be able to confess it. You just ought to own it. How many people know it's embarrassing sometimes to confess something you do, did was wrong or stupid, whatever? It's hard sometimes to confess those things. And we've been taught the only one we have to confess it to is God. That's not really true. You know, uh, 
If I have ought against a brother, I need to go get that thing straightened out. And then come to prayer with God. I need to get some things straightened out in life. One of the uh, things about recovery is not only recognizing the things that you've done wrong, uh, but going and trying to set those things right as much as you possibly can. Uh, I remember because I, when I got saved and I read that, man, I, I remember really being shaken. And I said, Lord, uh, I heard a lot of people as an unbeliever. How can I get that set straight? And what if I see them? And he said, if you see them, tell them about me and what I did for you. And then he goes on, and he shall bring his trespass offering into the Lord. Why? Why? I want you to know that we try to say certain things are different than other things. Sin is sin. Sin is sin. And we like to say, well, there's little sins and big sins. Sin is sin. It said in James to be guilty of one point of the law is to be guilty of all the law. And he shall bring his trespass offering into the Lord for his sin, which he hath sinned, a female from the flock, a lamb or a kid of the goats, for a sin offering, and the priest shall make an atonement for him concerning his sin. Did you know because priests ate uh, the part of the offerings that would happen there? I wonder if their doctors ever told them they had too much uh, cholesterol or anything. You reckon? No? Confession here is commanded for the first time. This is the first time we've heard it in Leviticus, confession. This has to do with secret sins. They were hidden sins, even if they be against God or man. Uh, therefore, and I kind of said this a while ago, but therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath ought against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, go thy way, and first be reconciled to thy brother, and then, then come and offer thy gift. When, uh, when you've done things that you cannot... Uh, uh, that you've not dealt with you got we've had people in this church be mad at each other for a long time and I'll say how long are you going to go on with that bitterness in your heart how many people know that if you're bitter about things it shows your weakness not there amen when somebody has done something against you and you hold this, this bitterness in you for a long time, it shows a weakness that you have. Uh, I had a guy say, well, I don't really understand. I don't know how to forgive him. I said, because you don't understand what forgiveness is. Biblical forgiveness has nothing to do with emotion. And I told him, I said, biblical forgiveness is the canceling of a debt. When Jesus forgave us, it's because he canceled our debt. When you can find people that have done things that they shouldn't have done to you and you want to know, how do I get released from this? Release them from that debt. When I went to my father after all those years of abuse, then as an adult, the Lord had told me to go forgive him. I, then God gave me an understanding of that. That didn't mean my emotions were going to immediately be made right. But it does mean that I can release him from the debt that he's incurred. So I went and told my dad, I said, I don't want to discuss anything with you. I just want you to know that I forgive you. And I will, now listen to this, I will never bring it up again. Do you understand what a release that was from my dad? So before he died, he, was, he got his life right with God and he was filling in pulpits for pastors when they'd leave. It transformed somebody to forgive them. But if all you can do is, well, I'm waiting until my emotions get better, you'll never do it. Even with that, did you know, even with the forgiving my father uh, f for the abuse as a child, did you know my wife and I never dropped our children off alone with, with my dad and mom. We just did. That was wisdom on our part. But they still loved dad. And dad changed an awful lot. I remember at Easter, as an old man, 
he'd, he'd sponsor an egg rolling thing in the line where he'd get down on his hands and knees and roll that egg with his nose along with the kids putting it up to a certain place. I thought, this is not the man I grew up with. <laughs> Forgiveness. Forgiveness. And so he talks about there has to be an offering. Things don't just go away because you want them to go away. What enabled me to cancel the debt with my dad? What enabled me to cancel that debt was when, the, when God let me know that when, he, when Jesus went to that cross, he canceled my dad's debt along with mine. So who am I to bring it up to him? Do you understand what I'm saying here? It's a deeper walk. And he goes on, If he be not able to bring a lamb, then he shall bring for his trespass, which he hath committed, two turtle doves, or two young pigeons, or a partridge in a pear tree. No, that's not what it is. Uh, <laughs> uh, which he hath committed, two turtle doves, two young pigeons unto the Lord, one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering. The emphasis is in the trespassing, the trespass offer is not in the character or position of the offer, but in the sacrifice itself. Two turtle doves were required as one is for a sin offering, one for the burnt offering. The persons and the work of Christ is represented. This was the sacrifice of who? Can I tell you who? The poor. Because he started out, if he, not, if, he, if he be not able to bring a lamb, we're talking about people that did not have the means to bring a lamb or a bullock or something else. Uh, uh, but God made a way for them. Now, I know that I'm ridiculously emotional about certain things. Well, the first time I read this, I said, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that you have provided an offering that anybody... With a, without a dime or with a dime can come because you've already provided the offering. And we see an example right here. God was saying, you may not have a dime to your name, but pigeons, turtle doves, things like you can put your hands on that. It's labeled a sin offering because it arises from the sin nature. And he shall bring them unto the priest who shall offer that which is for the sin offering first and wring off his head from his neck, but shall not divide it asunder. What's he mean? He's going to wring it, but not, but you, do you remember when God cut covenant with Abraham and they took the animals and, and put them in half and put halves on each side, very bloody thing. Yeah, but he shall bring it to the priest, shall offer that which is for the sin offering first, wring off his, uh, uh, his head from his neck, but shall not divide it asunder, and shall sprinkle of the blood of the sin offering upon the side of the altar, and the rest of the blood shall be wrung out at the bottom of the altar. It is a sin offering. Blood has to be shed through the head of the bird, through the body, even though the head was not removed. And he shall offer the second for a burnt offering according to the manner, and the priest shall make an atonement for him for his sin which he sinned and shall be forgiven him. The sinner was, uh, has complete forgiveness, even with the little bird. All of this points to Christ as the one sacrifice. It occurred to me when we started in Leviticus that I wouldn't be getting through a lot of a lot of uh, chapters at a time. But if he be not able, uh, if he be not able to bring forth two turtle doves or two young pigeons, then he that sin shall bring for his offering the tenth part of an ephah of fine flour for a sin offering. He shall put no oil upon it, neither shall he put any frankincense thereon, for it is a sin offering. The poorest of the poor was not left out. Couldn't bring a bird. He could bring what amounted to a piece of bread. You know, Isaiah 55, when he says, come one, come all, you know. Uh, we see this all through the Bible. God didn't want to leave anybody out. Uh, 
it's too bad today that we still have some Christians that want to leave certain people out because they don't meet the image of what they think should be in their church. But man, I'm serious when I say I, I want everybody in our church. Not everybody's going to come. Did you, you may not believe this, I like our little church, but we're not everybody's cup of tea. And uh, then shall they bring it to the priest, and the priest shall take the handful of it, even a memorial thereof, and burn it on the altar according to the offerings made by fire of the Lord. It is a sin offering. What is? That flower? And the priest shall make an atonement for him, touching his sin, that he has sinned in one of these, and it shall be forgiven him, and the remnant shall be the priest as a meat offering. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, If a soul commit a trespass and sin through ignorance, again, why can you not do it in ignorance? How can a, can a Christian sin in ignorance? No. Did you know that sin is willful disobedience of God? If you don't know it, how can it be willful? Right? So the truth about it is, is that we, we are led by the Holy Spirit. Somebody said, has the Holy Spirit ever led people to do things that, uh, that seem a little dishonest? Yes. Rahab didn't tell the truth when people came to try to find uh, the spies. She, she hit them when they were taking Jericho, Did, didn't she? She didn't say, hey, come on, they're hiding here. No. But she fulfilled her purpose. And the Lord spake in the Lord, saying, If a soul commit a trespass and sin through ignorance in the holy thing of the Lord, then he shall bring for his trespass in the Lord a ram without blemish out of the flock. And thy estimation by shekels of silver after the shekel of the sanctuary for a trespass offering. He shall make amends for the harm that he hath done in the holy thing, shall add the fifth part thereto and give it unto the priest, and the priest shall make an atonement for him with the ram of the trespass offering, and it shall be forgiven him. It's a, is anybody glad today that we don't have to go through somebody else? I don't have to go through a priest. Jesus is my great high priest. I go directly to Jesus. I've tried to really, I believe in praying for people, but uh, for years I was in ministry, I would go places where the whole thing was centered on the pastor, and they felt like if the pastor didn't lay hands and pray on them, then they were, th it wouldn't work. And it just disgusted me. And I said, we all have access to God, all of us. Right? So, uh, but when I was preaching as an evangelist, that was kind of the thing. I'd go there and I'd preach, and then afterwards I'd lay hands on the people and pray for them. It's not a sin to do that, but I just wanted to bring up a church that would understand that you, you have as much anointing as I do to turn to your neighbor and pray for them because God says so. Do you know what you do not have as much anointing as I do to do? to be the pastor of this church. Somebody said, well, pastors don't have any greater anointing. They have the anointing of a pastor. Don't think about greater or less. I have the anointing to be a pastor. And so there are certain things that God will bless me to be able to do that they can't be done by somebody else. And I'm not going to go into all this, but I've, I've went into it before, the differences the strengths and the weaknesses of the apostle, the prophet, the pastor, teacher, and evangelist. All of them have strengths and all of them have weaknesses. I heard my wife actually talking to somebody about my weakness today at the funeral. They said, he's such, one of the gals told me, he is such a nice guy. My wife said, yes, but sometimes too nice because people really get to him. <laughs> that the, the compassion that God gave a pastor can also be his weakness. But I want you to see through this, I've only got a few verses to do, that God, in this day and age, has not made it. Has, will the Holy Spirit ever leave you? If the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you, and he'll never leave you, then can you ever, and if he said that he wrote his laws and commands on our hearts and minds, 
then don't we know when we're doing things that are wrong? Right. You won't do things that ignorant. You won't do it. Now, the bad part about that is, that means when you do things you shouldn't do, you did it willfully. Amen? Ecclesiastes 5.5 5 says, Better it is that thou shouldest, uh, shouldest not vow than thou shouldest vow and not pay. Uh, and it, uh, there are a lot of things that people do that they shouldn't do. They make promises they don't keep. They see injustices that they don't stand up for when God wants us to stand up for injustice. Uh, we're led to do certain things and people won't do it out of fear. There are a lot of things that people do, but they know it. When I had a guy talk to me not too long ago, he said, man, well, I'll tell you who it was, my nephew. He said, man, I really feel, feel called uh, someday to pastor. And, and uh, he said, but I, I probably missed that chance being out of prison and all that kind of stuff. So you miss no chance. If the calling is on your life, the calling's on your life. Well, I don't know how to do things like other people. He didn't call you to be like other people. He called you to be like you. He's already got other people. Amen? You know, uh, I love Silas. Him and I are not the same. But he can, I can be the very best Bob I can be, and he can be the very best Silas he can be. And guess what? We'll work together, won't we? But with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, 1 Peter 1, 19, that's what we're cleansed of. And if a soul sin and commit, uh, uh, in 17, if a soul sin and commit any of these things which are forbidden to be done by the commandments of, his, of the Lord, though he wist it not, Yet he be guilty and shall bear his iniquity. He shall bring a ram without blemish of the flock with thy estimation for a trespass offering unto the priest. And the priest shall make an atonement for him concerning his ignorance wherein he erred with it not, and it shall be given him. If a trespass offering, he hath certainly trespassed against the Lord. Now, wait, now wait a second now. Uh, what's the difference in him again? What, what do we see in this, these people? Could, why could they do it in ignorance? Because what they had to do, they had to do without the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit didn't guide them, did he? Do you see that? What were they led by? The written law and what they'd been taught, and that came through Moses and the prophets. And so could they do something out of ignorance? Yeah. The Spirit of God didn't live them. That's the reason when the disciples were walking with Jesus and Jesus said this, he said, the Holy Spirit has been on you, but now he's going to be in you. I'm glad the Holy Spirit is in us. And we're led by his Spirit. Well, guys, that's all we're going to do. And we'll get into chapter 6 uh, next week. Is this all right? Are you guys getting bored with this stuff yet? Okay. I know it's tough sometimes you're going through things like that. You know, if you preach on things where people get to jump up and down, they love that. But sometimes you're getting down to the meat of the word. And, and I don't think it would mean as much to you and I if I didn't relate it to New, New Testament all the time. This is a complete book. It's God's love letter to us. He has a great way of showing us what's wrong, and he has a great way of showing us that he's right. Amen. Father, we just thank you for the time we spend here tonight. We pray, Lord God, this has been a blessing to everybody. I thank you for your Holy Spirit leading us, guiding us through life, living in us. I'm so glad that we are not under the covenant of the, uh, of the old covenant, which has passed away, but we're in the new covenant. This new covenant, Lord, is a covenant established upon better promises. One of them, that you indwell us and that you guide us. You stay with us. And Holy Spirit, you are our comforter and you are our teacher and our advocate and our standby. We thank you and we praise you for that. And we thank you. You're the one that can take this word and make it real to us. We give you praise and honor and glory for tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.